so um hi tim hi matt welcome to the beastly series now um i've recently seen your soon to be released documentary britain's big cat mystery uh i loved it i really like the big cat thing but i really like everything that went into that one it seems to me to be uh extremely high quality I would say network quality, you know, uh, and my impression is that it's uh, it's an independent venture. Um, so, you know, wow, well done to you guys. I'd, I'd like that's, to hear how you came up with that. There. You know, how well, did you um, how did you get to that level of excellence in this documentary? Not only in its um, composition, but with the the people we have involved in it, you know, the great witnesses and experts. I suppose the first thing to say would be if, if <laughs> the version you saw is an earlier cut, so you're in for a real treat when the, the final okay. cut comes out, because there's a lot more material, you know, that's going to be in the final thing. But in terms of the inception of, of the project, I suppose I best defer to Matt, because he's the creator, really. I joined the project halfway through. Okay. Okay. So uh, Matt... Tell us, tell us all, spill, spill the beans, you know. Okay, so the project was inspired actually by a sighting of mine. I think it was in 2017. It might have been 2016. It was in it was January. Earlier, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's what started it. But where I grew up in Somerset, I was always interested in it. I remember growing up and hearing about sort of cattle mutilations and stuff. And, uh, even when I was a kid, I remember going out with a BB gun and a Victorian Ox pen knife with my mate trying to hunt the beast. <laughs> Thank God <laughs> you didn't find it. I would see one you know, <laughs> some years later. And, and when did you see one? 2017, you say? I think it was, yeah. It was in January. At the time, I was, uh, I was working on a construction site for David Wolves and Holmes. And uh, it was just getting light, still fairly dark, and this huge black animal bolted out in front of me wow. I overcame over the hedge or through the hedge I'm not really sure but it was panicking when it landed in front of me so I had to do an emergency stop and uh, it sort of span around a couple of times looking for an exit and the only place it could go was over a five bar gate which it did which is pretty high you know that's that's pretty high that's like m almost five foot yeah I and mean that's not a dog jump a five bar gate is not a dog jump all well, I knew it wasn't a dog is when it turned and looked at me. It was just obviously a, a cat that just scaled up. And, you know, having German shepherds at home, or two of them, and I could say it was a similar size to them. Wow. And, and what, what would you, obviously, you've made this documentary, and you've studied a lot about big cats. And, and what would you say your sighting, what cat would it most resemble you know, in the pantheon of of normal cats that we know, big cats uh, that are alive in the world today. Well, it was it was black, so you'd say a panther. But then, of course, a panther is not a it's not a it's not like a species of cat or subspecies. Uh -huh. it, it's just like uh, being ginger. It's melanistic. It's, uh -huh. So most likely, it's a leopard because leopards most likely have a melanistic gene or jaguars. Mm -hmm. Humans, it's not not so common. So I would probably say a black leopard or a black jaguar. I mean, even if they are black, you can see rosettes on them if mm. they're in the right light. But because it was that time in the morning, it just looked jet black, but and my headlights were shining off of it. So wow. I would say leopard or black jaguar. I to me, it's amazing, especially um, my my introduction to this came in 1999 when I was uh, I was staying in a place called Crimach in Pembrokeshire uh, in West Wales facing the Priscilla Mountains about they were about a mile down the road but the foot of where we were anyway ex-girlfriend's parents place everybody was up for Christmas and um, one of her mother's friends was a lady from London like a heavy smoker and she went out at 5 a.m. onto the patio to have uh, a smoke because you wouldn't like to smoke in the house and she reported when we you know woke up that day that she'd seen 10 feet away a black panther staring at her in the yeah. light of her in, in a, the light of her light she lit her cigarette and just kind of froze looked at her for there 10, it was right 15 in front seconds of her. and just walked away well we were we were starting to think oh really until 
her younger sister piped up, uh, my ex-girlfriend's younger sister, to say that she'd seen one the year before, and she was a super skeptical kind of girl, while she was horse riding away from a friend's farm over the mountain, and she'd look back when she got to the top, and saw it chasing sheep around in one of the, the farm pens. Uh, so yeah, I mean they were pretty convinced, and that very day we all went out looking for it. We didn't have a pen knife, so we were in danger, but uh, <laughs> uh, or a BB gun, so we weren't armed. But uh, uh, yeah, that just started me saying, "Wow, oh, this is not an escapee." I looked in sort of like you know, the newspapers and all the little reels and archives. There's no escapee, as far as I know. How could this happen? And that's when I discovered, probably similarly to yourselves this big wealth of big cat sightings around the country. So tell me about the documentary. How did it get started? You had that sighting um, that affected you for some time. Did people accept your sighting or did they kind of laugh at you and say, come on, you know, you saw a dog or. Um, They're both really, um, yeah. I guess, I guess most people have sight and would experience that. So, so I actually reported my sighting to a guy called Frank Tunbridge. Um, who yeah. was who was just uh, like one of the first hits on Google that I mm. got, and then after speaking to him about it, and then decided that I was going to make the film, he then was able to point me in directions to certain people. Mm -hmm. um, but it's hard to get into into the group because people are quite wary, especially filmmakers, and how how they might be portrayed. So it was hard to sort of get the trust and to get into that group. Yeah. But they're a great bunch of people and the film wouldn't, you know, be what it is today without any of them. It seems to me, uh, meeting somebody like Frank, that, that really is the key to the whole um, society, community of big cat people. He's probably one of the most respected people out there, I'd imagine. Um, and I would also imagine he's somebody that's held that torch up while he's been laughed at for, you know, decades. Oh, in God, decades, yeah, yeah. and uh, you've got to have some serious conviction for that kind of thing. Um, now, what about you know, starting to, to interview the witnesses? What what kind of similarities in their experience did you find? Was, it, was there one or two certain types of big cats that kept coming up in the sightings? Or are there just like many types of cats that people see? Uh, people often tell me there seems to be two particular types of big cats that are spotted all the time. And I, I just wondered if that rang true for you as well. Uh, so it's, there's actually the statistics. Um, it's in the film. I can't think of the top of my head, but it's very much in favor of black cats. Mm -hmm. And then I think like a puma sandy colored sort of 20 to 30%. And I think there's also a regional thing. There's like certain areas that might like, for instance, I think Devon and Cornwall might be more prone to the sandy colors and, mm. and the rest of the generally to the black yeah i think it's um i think it's about 80 percent of reported sightings tend to be of a black uh -huh. large black cat and then as matt says you know um uh the the, the remaining percentage is is the sandy colored but there's also a minority of reports of of you know cats that would fit the description of a lynx as well mm. so um but they tend to be in in you know the, the less frequent you uh -huh. know, reports um, but yeah, I would say yeah, the regional thing seems to run, you know, ring true. Certainly in Gloucestershire, where where I'm based, it does seem to be that you know there's a, a higher proportion of, of black cat sightings. Uh -huh. um, but there are, you know, there are others too. Well, it, it's it's fascinating. I feel, and it's not cryptozoology strictly, but um, I, I call that they're in the the order of out of place animals for me. Sure, I think really. The, the big cats in the UK, they're the future grey squirrels and Canada goose of this country. At some point in 50 years' time, you, your children or your children's children just won't know that we never had big cats, you know, or that they didn't come from here. And I try to explain it to my daughters that the grey squirrel and the Canada goose, they're not actually from here. So they're, they're on British animals. Well, how did yeah. they get here? She said, look, they're everywhere. Of course they're British, Daddy. Look, there's one. There's that's some great other examples 20. as well. Mm. Like, you know, the, the terrapin freshwater yes. uh, turtles, the, you know, mm. the, the redneck wallabies, you know, um, there's, there's, there's all sorts yeah. of things that, you know, we, we, we've brought lots of things to this little island over the years and some yeah. of them are doing well. You yeah. know. Rabbits, raccoons. 
Skunks. Romans brought rabbits, of course. Yeah. The skunks. Brought rabbits. They've got skunks, apparently. There's a couple. I think there's a couple wandering about. <laughs> um, well, apparently they're just about to reintroduce buffalo down yeah, here in the south, in Kansas, southeast. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, <laughs> I, I, there's a lot of deer in the, nearby the area I live in. And uh, she goes through right, this even more. But the, a few of the parks here, there's a lot of deer. And around September, October time, it's treacherous. You know, to go through those parks because they're really grumpy. And uh, uh, I just imagine, you know, walking up on a grumpy buffalo at some point in Sussex or something and not knowing when we're going to be, you know, it's, worth, it's bad enough to get like a, a boar or something. Um, so, yeah, I'm just like, okay, it's great. We've got stuff in this country. But it seems to me that, you know, it would be nice at some point for British people to kind of know what what's out there and where it is i know a lot of people worry about people going and hunting them and shooting them. i just don't think that's a big thing for us there are a few idiots out there but in the case of big cats it's so hard to find them anyway it's unlikely anybody could go and shoot them in my opinion if they were alerted to their presence what are your thoughts on that do people should people have a right to know that they're here for their own protection uh, or their own awareness or what do you think I think is a bit of a minefield that one really yeah I mean um tried to generate a bit of discussion earlier on the Facebook page for, for the documentary yeah, yeah about just different kinds of warning signs that are used in in yeah. the states and uh you know generally a negative view of of putting up warning signs you know that was the initial reaction I think over time we might get a few more voices in there but um the perception of, of certainly those that commented seemed to indicate a concern that you know you might have mob-handed people, you know, take into the woods to try and find the beast, so to speak. Yeah. And you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, there's there's all manner of different problems that, that that could manifest. And I share those concerns with you know a lot of other people who look at this subject. But I also I do think that eventually the truth will out. And yeah. I do like to think that perhaps our anxiety is a misplaced and maybe the British people generally might, might be more receptive to hearing that news than we think, but it's still a concern until, until things unfold, we don't know really what, you know, what the future holds and how people will respond. But I think Matt, Matt is also anxious, but I'll let him tell you his views. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Matt? uh, It's in their best interest to perhaps sort of remain in, yeah. in in folklore, perhaps, which is a view shared by a lot of people. Yeah, like, I, I get that a lot from a lot of people. When I started making the film, as a lot of people have done in the past, it's all about getting the money shot, getting the proof. But for me, it's not about that now. Um, yeah. It's a big journey, you know, like from from the re- releases and and the evidence. It's all really interesting stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's talk about that i mean just finally on the um the should the public know that they're around the signs that you released on your facebook page earlier were things like um uh mountain lions spotted make loud noises walking groups pick up your child that kind of thing these are the same mountain lions pumas that are spotted here in the, the same leopards that attack people in india i had, had a thought for a long time about why aren't we having attacks here? And I thought, well, is it because there's so many prey species with our predators? And essentially, you know, humans aren't natural prey for most animals anyway. And why bother when you've got your natural prey all around you? You know, what's it, 33 and a half million rabbits, millions of deer, and then there's boar, and then the sheep. I mean, yes, we lose, you know, 16,000 like a, a year to dog them, kill. Right? It is. It's it's basically it's a buffet, and nobody's at the bar, and um, you know they can just eat what they want. I, to me, it seems that might be the reason that people aren't being attacked. But people have been. I'll let you guys talk about some of these incidences now as well. Intimidated or stalked or sort of walked out of woods sometimes. Do you, do you have any experiences like that that you guys know about? So not being, personally, yeah. Um, but yeah, I've I've heard certainly you know some accounts of that nature you know where people do have you know mildly confrontational experiences that you know uh could be quite frightening Mm -hmm. um but thankfully that just seems to be the bottom line really it does tend to 
you know, sort of get out of my space. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, the, you know, the, the reports of people actually being injured, you know, are, are almost non-existent. You know, the, mm-hmm. the, the reports that you can corroborate and confirm, you know, there may be rumours, but, you know, I'm not so much interested in rumours. There's so much rumour around this subject, you know, um, got to try and substantiate it with fact. And as you say, the truth is, you know, mm-hmm. there, there are very few, if any, you know, credible accounts of people being seriously maimed or, or disabled or injured or killed yeah. um so yeah. i don't think it's a risk i think like you say there's a buffet out there there's you know why would they go for a, a big lumbering clumsy upright ape that could potentially cause them injury and you know challenge their status as a predator of course a yeah. predator gets injured it's it's not able to do its job yeah. in the ecosystem and then all of a sudden it can't enjoy the buffet so you know, I mean, my personal opinion would be if the cat becomes injured itself, or old or infirm, and you know, not fast enough to to hunt um, the fast sure. prey like rabbits and things like that. Now, there's obviously we're, we're skipping a big part here. Now, I'm, I always have this habit of talking to people. Like everybody knows what's going on. People are going to be asking why are the big cats in the UK. Or at least in in this particular epoch of their existence here, you know, how did they come to be here? Matt, go for it. Well, you know, the most credible theory is, and what I believe as well, is it was due to a combination of escapees and releases stemming from the, the sort of 60s, 70s, even up to the 80s, where people had them as pets, and obviously... It's sort of going over again. The Dangerous Wild Animals Act came in. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to have a license for the for the uh, enclosures, and some people couldn't afford it. So, you know, some were given to zoos, some maybe even destroyed, and others were possibly released. Mm-hmm. And I think that what what we had is like a a population that stems from that, and it was topped up maybe over several several decades. And there is potentially a small breeding population here. Yeah, I mean, what kind of numbers do you think we're, we're talking about? Because there are, I mean, just for anybody who's listening, there are, there are sightings nationwide. Every region, at least, has, and every nation within the UK has sightings, right? Has numerous sightings, not just yeah. ones and twos, but tens, twenties, hundreds in some places. I mean, people um, also forget in this debate as well that, that you know, this is an issue in, in Northern Ireland as well. Some of my reading wow. and literature on it, you know, so that Irish Sea didn't stop uh, the the cats making it there as well. So um, a lot yeah. of my literature that I've, I've, I've gone through um, seems to indicate they've had the same sort of issue historically over there. And I think, as Matt says, I, um, you know, the, the Dangerous Wild Animals Act, um, but I think they had different legislation in Northern until Ireland. Until recently, they they didn't have any legislation until very exactly. recently. And you could actually own a tiger cub or a lion and walk it down a country lane until very, very recent times. I was just looking at that the other day. There's something that came in a few years back. Yeah. Sorry to jump on you there. But yeah. yeah no, ahead. I just I find it really interesting. You know, um, but like, like Matt says, all across, you know, um, all across Britain from, you know, the 60s onwards the the sightings were really out of control but there there are some good fairly good anecdotal reports going back um you know they're hard to substantiate because you're going back sort of to around the second world war mm-hmm. but um there are a lot of reports of um american naval ships having mascots um uh, of big cats okay. uh, that came over here um and also some of the suggestions were that some of the menageries and the private collections, of course, when rationing came in and you had very limited meat rations to feed the whole family, um, you have to make some hard choices, you know. You so, do. You do. I mean, that makes sense to me. Um, there's something that's happened recently, and just get your opinion on this, you guys. These uh, Savannah cats, you know, the F1 okay. was the uh, civil domestic cross. Uh, there was a, a sighting here recently. The police were called out and a marksman. And clearly the picture uh, is shown is a large savannah cat. Um, they're kind of pretty, but they can be a little wild, a little rambunctious. Not really great domestic cats, in my opinion. And the sightings of those are increasing year on year because people buy them. They're really cute. Then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. I think you get a grumpy one one day, you get scratched or you get, you know, uh, confronted by it in the house. And you think, oh, gosh let it go and that that was a bit of a mistake 
And I wonder if the, you know that kind of thing happened a lot pre nineteen seventy six as well. They just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and you know you can't go to the zoo and say I don't want this anymore. You don't want to shoot the thing. You just say, it's oh, quite possible. Just kind of let it go, and hopefully it appear in the wilds of wherever when nobody goes. It'll sort of peter out by itself. I mean, just from my experience growing up, I often heard similar sort of you know conversations when people had cute little puppies and then you know six months down the line they're big lumbering beasts you know and they yeah. thought well six months ago this was cute you know now it's now it's yeah. getting to be a challenge you know now so i'm being dragged quite... across the park every day by a bull mastiff and well, <laughs> yeah. well yeah yeah exactly i didn't realize it would be this big now yeah. i mean you know uh, yes a big there is a Christmas, guy in the uh, documentary who grew up around cats which we could say and, uh, you know, as a kid, he had a full grown tiger sleeping on his bed. Okay. And he says that they actually were, they bond with people quite well. Um, and he never encountered anything to make him sort of fear them or, or, mm. or doubt them in any way. But of course, there are evidence of incidents of other people where it has. So it's a bit of a hard one. Yeah. And maybe that's the same brave. with dogs. Yeah. Right? I mean, some people's dogs turn on them. And, uh, I, I just think that all animals are quite individual. Some you know, good bears and bad bears and cowardly bears and bold bears sure. and all the rest of it. Um, and in the documentary, you, know, you talk to some great expert, experts there about what happened. Now, I've got some theories about what happened just before the 1976 legislation was, was introduced. And um, you know, one of the things I put in a little chapter in my book, uh, book about it actually was the stipulations and I'm sure you've read this a few times but you know in section 3 C and F of the act you, you can read the requirement that any animal concerned will at all times if it's being kept only under the authority of their license be held and the accommodation which secures that the animal will not escape which is suitable as regards construction size temperature lighting ventilation drainage and cleanliness and which is suitable for the number of animals proposed to be held in the accommodation while any animal concerned is at the premises where it normally be held, its accommodation is such that it can take adequate exercise in the accommodation. So that must be the enclosure. Now, can you imagine how prohibitive that must be? And to me, um, the, the key to why they were released as, was always there. You know, that, 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 that section is the key. You know, adequate space for this thing to run around in the enclosure and take proper exercise. How I mean, who determines this? what's ad adequate? It must be reasonable. I mean, look, when you go to the zoos, what, what kind of enclosures do they have there? Beyond the means of most people, I'd say. Yeah, exactly. Um, so did you speak to many people who, who admitted to letting them go or, or knew about people that let them go? I suppose this was this is one of the tasks that Matt gave me. Um, and uh, it, it was difficult tracking down witnesses to events that we're talking 40 50 years ago yeah we did have a fair degree of success though um um surprisingly um you know just in terms of adding substance to the rumors you know because we're all aware of the rumors oh people may have let yeah. them go and you know releases escapes the famous but keeper in mama show lou um I forget his last name. Okay. Thing. You know the one we're talking Foley, about. Foley, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, he, he, you know, obviously he's no longer with us, so, you know, couldn't get to speak to him. But there's, you know, some, some interesting stuff in the in the old newspaper articles if you go through and prepare to do the, the digging and the reading and, uh, you know, looking up names and places. Yeah. There are still a couple of characters out there that can be tracked down or people, associates of, of key characters. So um, we, we had a fair degree of success. But of course, you know, we were always met with the uh, usual reluctance of anyone um, being approached by, uh, you know, a, a film company or, mm. you know, people claiming to be in a film company or whatever. There's anxieties, you know, what, how are you going to spin this story? You know, I think that's reasonably legitimate in most cases. Yeah, sure. It's um, now we've all done. I've done plenty of interviews where, essentially, you know, you're being portrayed as some sort of nutbag, <laughs> for just having an interest in strange and unusual sightings. And uh, even with big cats, you know, that can be that can still be quite a significant 
um, uh, significant uh, obstacle for people to get past because they live in small communities, perhaps. They have to tell all of their friends and all the people they've grown up with, yeah, I think I saw a big cat. And people don't want to believe things like that. Uh, you I were mean, drunk, you were a bit tired, you saw a dog, you saw a black sheep, you, you saw a pony. Yeah. yeah, it's a misidentification. We believe you think you saw yes. a big cat. Oh, Great. you're not lying, yeah. you're just wrong. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pockets of swamp gas. Yeah, well, swamp gas can uh, can mimic big cat sightings from time to time, I hear. <laughs> and Bigfoot sightings and all other kinds of things, actually. Weather balloons. Swamp gas. Weather balloons, when they touch down with those cat-shaped baskets. They, um, yeah. Oh, God. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Notorious for it. Um, I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, I always say to, <clears throat> well... You know, big cats, at least we know that they actually do exist in the world. So it's an easier subject. But some of the other subjects I look at sometimes, I always say to people, you know, it's a big ask. You're asking people to believe in a big thing, even about big cats living in Britain, because every, even especially if you live in the countryside, the normal mindset is to say, well, I've been here for 50 years and I've never seen this thing people talk about. If I haven't seen it, it can't exist. If we're not seeing them all over the place, they can't be. But people... I think that's because people perceive this to be a small country, but don't realize the amount of unpeopled land there is within the country so much. where Nobody's walking, nobody, even if it's owned, nobody's there walking about and, you know, doing their thing every day. It's not like living in London or Bristol or Manchester. It's sure. a different world. Most of the country's kind of rural. Um, I mean, you're in Gloucester. Gloucester's a great city, but you know, a step two miles outside the city, that's the countryside. I can go less than a mile. I'm right in central there Boston, walk less than a mile, and I can be in what would feel like the middle of nowhere quite yeah. easily. There in fact, go. actually, there's there's quite fa fairly frequent sightings of big black cats in the area I'm thinking of. Wow. wow. Almost central Gloucester. You know, there was a, a fairly good report came in. Um, we're talking maybe six, seven weeks ago now. Mm. Three sisters out walking the dog one afternoon. Um, taking their, their their dog for a walk around a you know a small sort of pond um, near the ski slope actually in in, in Gloucester, and there um, was a big black cat walked out casually mm -hmm. in front of them, and they reported the sighting. And then probably within less than two weeks later, uh, another gentleman um, was walking around by the golf course and saw a huge black cat. Um, you know, so yeah, wilderness right on my doorstep, even though I'm in a in a sort of what you'd consider a built-up city, really, yeah. a small built-up city. Yeah. But... but still, they come in. They come in. I'm, I'm just on the outskirts of Surrey. I mean, literally 50 yards over the, the border from London, Surrey, <laughs> the sign there. And you know, a little further on from us, Rusper, which is it's in Hampshire, actually, but it's on the border of Surrey as well. Uh, you probably hear me talk about this a few bits. A few people have. 2017 horse breeder. She's going to collect a hay consignment late at night, November, drives into the farm. Nobody's there. You just pick it up and load up the truck and go. She's with a friend. She's got the lights on, high beams. It's a dark night. 40 feet away, there is a large male black panther um, walking towards them. They see it clear enough to see, one, that it's male, two, that it licks its lips. And strolls off into a hedge as it's coming towards them. And she would never have seen it had they not gone back to kind of jump out of the truck and get close the gate on the way out. And, and there it is. And she, when she contacted me, she didn't know anything about this. She said, has there been an escape? Somebody said, I should contact you and check if that one has escaped from a zoo. I said, no, it's, it's local. <laughs> it's a local. It and lives there. Yeah, it lives there, basically, on uh, that farm where you go regularly to collect your hay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, me. good luck I mean, to you. Yeah. <laughs> but she said You'll it was Matt unaffected, but unaffected by them, Matt. It, it looked at them. It was not concerned. It did not care. Sauntered but it licked its lips. Place. Well, you know, like cats do sometimes. They kind <laughs> of they lick around their face. And I think that's what she sure. meant. Not that it went mm, tasty. but um, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's dinner. Yeah, 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 and did it many more besides. And um, in fact, when I started writing this book, all I got at the beginning was just big cat sightings, tons and tons and tons and tons of them just coming through that never been reported to anybody. 
I thought this is amazing. This is a book in itself. Just you know, just those kinds of things. Um, why can't we? Why can't we get any any traction with this? Surely the government, surely the public, or DEFRA or whoever, you know, want to get involved and say, let let's find out what the reality of the situation is. Well, why do you think that's not happening? There's a lot of barriers to it, I suppose. One of the things that I've been doing for the documentary is um, looking into freedom of information mm. requests and things of that nature. And in doing so, there, it's clear there's evidence in places and, you know, some people are recording it, but it's not really clear within all the different organisations and different public bodies and branches of the government who's taking responsibility for what, who's getting a budget for what, how you're going to compensate people who are affected, um, okay. you know, what the impact is on, you know, livestock farmers and, you know, um, things of that nature. Things like tourism, use of the, the, the woodlands and the countryside, is that going to be affected? Are people going to say we're not letting our kids out? Um, you know, there's a huge minefield of things. And it's still, I suppose the central thing that's preventing any decisive action or or anything of that nature is it's it's cost and who's taking responsibility okay you know okay so do you think this is a british thing that we have here a lot of the time uh, one of the americans asked me um are your government denying the existence of big cats i said no they're doing something very british about it they're just not answering the question they're just ignoring the question and that's a great way for the, the psychological way to dismiss something in a way. I mean, in general, they're ignoring the question. Um, and it seemed to me to be, would there be a big cost? Sure, actually, you know, the, the, the current depends world, what I they think. choose as the, you know, depends what course of action was determined. You mean to conserve or to, to eradicate? Yeah or, yeah, or or maybe a combination of both. And how do you determine yeah. the balance point? You know, um, yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's just a minefield and, you know, without any sort of infrastructure or designated body to, to sort of tackle that, um, it's, uh, it, it remains unclear. Um, but I suppose, you know, there, there are historic, you know, good, good accounts of, you know, the police will obviously take it seriously if it's deemed that yeah. there's an immediate threat. And yeah, they do yes, there are them. people you can talk yeah. to if, if there are, you know, immediate concerns. But I suppose for general widespread <laughs> sort of um, moving any uh, any progress with the issue beyond, you know, immediate res resolving, yeah. you know, any any sort of threats or risks, doesn't seem that there's a, a clear route towards doing so. And and from your perspective, uh, perspective uh, Matt, that's for the best. You say you're in the, 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 the leave them be camp. Yeah, I, I would say I am. Um, I think it's in their best interest to be there, but there are sort of people trying to coordinate with the government, perhaps in a future project, but it's still yet to come to fruition. But the, mm. the sort of framework's being done now. Okay, so there is something that's happening. There, well, there's, there's there's talk. Uh, the, the, people are starting to coordinate okay. and thinking about coordinating um, a more sort of formal response to things. But again, it's just at the discussion stage, really. I think, but um, it's it's just there's so many people you need to sort of get around the table who've got a yeah. vested interest in it. You know, the landowners, you know, farmers, hunters, you know, representatives of yeah. government, police. And it's just how how do you do that? It's um, it's a real challenge. It's a real I, challenge. I mean, I suppose the compensation side for some of the farmers at the moment, you know, we think we use about sixteen thousand odd sheep to dog killed. But yeah. well, you we say found that, that they weren't dog killed. You should check I mean, out. I don't know when it's coming out, but Rick Minter's latest podcast is with Eric Lay, who's the farmer who lost all his livestock back in the eighties. Oh. So I think it's the first time that I know of that you know he's been interviewed on it. Uh, so that might be worth checking out. I would definitely check that out. Absolutely. And Rick, you guys have been on this podcast a, a few times, haven't you? Now, does he only specialise in, in the big cat phenomenon or is it a general podcast for all um, things unusual? It's, it's purely big cats, but I think there is an overlapping interest with um, interesting wildlife and things uh -huh. like that. I know he's had people from uh, the Cornwall Beaver Project uh, oh, yeah. uh, on there you know, to, to talk about their things, but purely you know a main focus on big cats you know 
and, and talking about this thing, and I will come to that, the release of the documentary and everything in a minute, but um, you remind me really going back there when you talked about the 80% of all of the statistically, we, you know, with what we know, what we have, 80% of all of the big cat sightings in this country being melanistic leopards or, or jaguars, or panthers, black panthers. This is quite an unusual um, feature in cats around the world. And I, I read something, it was a little while ago, I tried to write a blog about it, but I realized I couldn't realistically make a true evaluation of the big cat population in the UK, like until it's you know done and dusted and discovered. But there were 8,000 tigers living in captivity in the United States, in captivity, which constituted one of the largest tiger populations in the world. And I thought, wow, isn't that amazing that actually those pet owners are actually keeping the species alive. And then I thought about the the black panthers here in the UK and thought, wow, what if we have the highest density of melanistic leopards in the entire on the entire planet? Wouldn't that be a, a, an incredible phenomenon to discover? Well, it's, 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 you know, it sounds bizarre, but, you know, until it's properly studied and you can actually yeah. look at hard empirical data, it's going to be impossible to know. But it's, it's actually... Yeah. It's actually a possibility. Yeah. Interesting thing that I found out only recently about the melanistic leopard is it's um, that expression, that trait is due to a double recessive gene. Uh -huh. So if you have two melanistic parents, they will only produce melanistic offspring. And, you know, the, 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 the British craze for, you know, having the rarest and, the, you know, the, the most special. It was very most, popular. Yeah, and yeah. you know, apparently there was an abundance of black leopards naturally occurring in like the Javan Peninsula in uh -huh. Indonesia, and that is apparently where a lot of these um, exotic pets were sourced uh -huh. from those regions. So um, that's where we got our black leopards apparently into into our country from. And so if we have got a, you know a nucleus population of 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 those which we pulled out of uh, the Javan you know jungles and 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 released over here then it stands to reason we will not get spotted leopards in that population i mean and that and that's a funny aspect of this whole thing the the reports of um, classic leopards classical leopards if you like uh, are very few and thin on the ground aren't they so as you say if they are escapees which you would expect they would be or releases then these two parents from the just the same with the same recessive gene meeting up uh, would um reliably confer that onto the generations below them um and just talking about the documentary now that the first version i've seen obviously the pre-version the second version is, is going to be releasing when are you hoping to release it and where can people find it where will they be able to go in and watch it or where will they be able to buy it well the process will be once i finish the edit which should probably be by the end of this month Okay. Uh, there's going to be a bit of a delay because I'll go on the international festival circuit first, um, which means I won't be able to to release it until that process is finished. Uh -huh. uh, so we'll be going to the festivals, and the success of it at festivals would probably dictate to where it ended up. Okay, okay. And so, are they still going ahead the festival? Yeah, they just moved to an online, so COVID's obviously okay. Is, Oh, it's well, not doing that's, that's perfect. Uh, minimal travel costs. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah. get a free hotel normally if you get uh, if you get selected. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No red carpet deal for us, eh? But well, you could just buy a, a red rug and um, crack open some champagne after you show the film. And I, I'm I've done some one or two online conferences so far, and although I prefer the travel in the one way because I like to do that. Like travel right now is nightmarish. I, the, the thought of being on a, like an eight or nine hour flight with a mask on the entire time with 200 other people who are incredibly paranoid is just uh, my idea of hell to be. Uh, the tube is bad enough. Um, so, yeah, that's, um, I don't the, mind. The film's changed, right? So, the original cut, I think I finished it in 2017, 2000, beginning in 2018. I think I got it down to 45 minutes, so it was in the short documentary category, whereas this new one's at 90 minutes, and I've still got more content to add, so okay. that'll be a feature length, and there's a possibility it would work well as a three-part three, three part TV series as well, like, like one part looking at the history, 
the second at the evidence and the third a sort of a bit of a surprise I wouldn't really want to let that out quite now okay that's fine <laughs> I, won't, I won't try to break your silence um and get the, the can out of the bag so to speak sorry for the pun I love um, it. I love it. yeah i've been trying to resist that one this entire chat um but it crept up on me eventually that's well perfect. i think you know it's amazing <laughs> I am a dad. I am a dad now for the last seven years, and that gives me. I'm fully licensed for all cheesified jokes and all dad jokes and all plays on the you know, stuff that that doesn't even enlist a murmur in some cases. And my wife, <laughs> she's very understanding, and she says it's not that you're not funny. It's just you forget to tell people that they're jokes, and your voice never changes its tone. It's always the same, serious, joking, laughing. Anyway, so enough of my um, marital issues but um in regards to, to what you guys are doing do you are you going to be getting out there even further now is the documentary done you're moving on to bigger and better things other creatures other subjects or you know are you regularly out there with game cams and walking and big cat hotspots and, and trying to find uh real-time evidence you know have those face-to-face encounters i think it could become like a a lifetime sort of thing for me like interest but in terms of new subjects, it's hard to, especially in the UK, the subject matters for me is kind of boring because I'm from here. But like uh-huh. Big Cat, a very cool thing. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot, of like a lot of my other projects were done overseas, mostly in Southeast Asia, and I just okay. find those places that it's all it's the unknown, right? It's like the unknown is yeah. interesting. Well, I also think that it's always easier conceive to conceive of something. Um strange and unusual in the far away because we don't know that place so it seems more credible to us that something could happen where we're film. not i'll send to you uh, i did yeah. one about philippine folklore wow i'd love that about the aswang i'll send that to you that's quite Wait interesting have we talked about the aswang before was that your documentary uh, there's another guy from america that did one called the aswang phenomenon i imagine it's probably his that's the one i've good. seen yeah. It's really good. Yeah, yeah. it's good. Yeah, yeah. That, but the aswang, I mean, it's is it pterosaur? Is it a mothman? That creature of sorts. Wonderful, interesting stuff, but very folkloric. So very hard to pull apart. Yeah, especially when you um, when you investigate uh, a culture that's that sort of mixes the two. You get that in Ireland a lot too. Mixes them very intricately. You know the. Um, mythical and, and perhaps even real-time sightings they get sort of blended together thinking is this a folklore thing is this a myth or is it something you've actually seen <laughs> i think there it was like catholicism sort of um sort of you know how will i say it like twisting the, the indigenous beliefs of their pagan yeah. pagan you know so, so sort of, is it sort of a kind of a catholicism animistic um, religious belief mix. I don't know what their religion is there in the Philippines. I mean, the, the uh, traditional religion, anyway. Very Catholic, yeah, they are now. Yeah. I mean, uh, originally, uh, they have original religion, some sort yeah. of animistic uh, pagan belief. Well, there's Certainly a, lot of... a lot of things all meshed into one sort of story, yeah. and you know, yeah. um, but I think Matt's got quite a clear sort of view on. on 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 what's you know what what might be real and what might not be it seems that yeah. uh, you know there may be elements of politics and propaganda embedded in the storytelling and okay. you know the motivations for for doing for telling those stories um it's quite interesting but very complicated oh, well, send it to me, not... man. I'll, I'll post it on the page and the people are always interested in that kind of stuff there you go yeah so uh, okay. yeah it's, it's it's a great it's a it's, it's a great watch actually but it's it you know, for me, like having a little sneak peek at some some of the you know the the works that Matt's got in his back catalogue is um, you can see him develop over over years and the improvements in his documentary making and it's it's definitely an area of specialty. But I can't yeah. get enough of the content. You know, if there's a documentary going about you know big cats or any kind of cryptid, you know, usually depending on the presentation, I can get into it and yeah. uh, I, I'll just soak all that up like a sponge. You know. Yeah. Um, uh, well, there's a market for. I mean, people people like it. They like to discover something they don't know about the unknown, and um, it's nice if the format is tidy and professional. And I don't mean that in um, in a complimentary way. It was 
it was hard for me to recognize that the documentary wasn't just something passed by a network. And I really mean that. I was like, oh, okay, this, okay, let's have a look at this. Oh, wow, that's kind of pretty good. Okay, no, I like that. that that's really smooth. And um, then after about 10 minutes, I just watched it, which I never do. I just normally sit there over examining everything, you know. I thought, okay, it's nice. I, I watched the documentary instead of thinking, instead of sitting there thinking about it for the whole time. But anyway, it's so um, slick, isn't it? I think that, that goes, I, I, I wish I could take credit for that, but that's all Matt. That's uh, all uh, Matt. All those, you know, funky editing skills, you know, which I can only dream of ever mastering. I, I don't even know how to turn the computer on, you know. Well, um, so I'm best, best place. Uh, Tim, so um, you, you got that far, and I think that's commendable. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 I think I've been helpful, you know, just just going through old books and, you know, newspaper articles. It's amazing the wealth of information which is already out there on this subject, which gets forgotten about, buried, yeah. looked over and missed, you know. So um, real revelation, Definitely. I suppose, for me in, in this journey was when Matt told me to, you know, give up trying to get the Patterson Gimlin footage of the uh, British big cat phenomenon. And he said, go back into the past, just yeah. turn over every stone just again, you know, just make sure we haven't missed yeah. anything. And in doing that, we actually uncovered some gems. We, we found some treasure along the way. So, uh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. well, I would suggest to, to everybody who's out there to, to definitely check it out, or at least check out the trailer while they can and while they're waiting for the documentary to come out. Now, um, just before we wrap up, where can people find you? How can they get involved? And what happens if they want to give you a sighting or something like that? Well, what do they do? How do they get in touch? Okay, so um, we've got a Facebook page at the moment, which is um, Britain's Big Cat Mystery. Um, and you can go along there and if you can send us a message. So if anyone has got any recent sightings, wants any advice on the issue, um, the messages will come through to me and Matt. And then obviously we've got a team of people attached to the project. So if there's anything specific comes up, we can throw that onto them. Um, the trailer is available to watch on the Facebook page and on the website at www.britainsbigcatmystery.com. Um, and there'll be new content being released over the next couple of weeks. We're going to do some more theatrical trailers, a couple of teasers, you know, and there's new content on the Facebook page every day. So go there, check it out. Give us a thumbs up, share it with your friends. Fantastic. Fantastic. And thank you both for joining me today. I do suggest everybody out there, if you if you love the cats and you want to know more about ours, then, then watch this documentary because it really is something special. Uh, Tim, Matt, thank you so much for joining me. It's been absolutely awesome. Pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye.